My name is David Cavill. As an experienced dog breeder, dog judge and teacher, I'm going to try and explain the basic facts of genetic health because it is clear that many people, including those who made the television programme Pedigree Dogs Exposed, do not have a clear idea of how companion animals in general and pedigree dogs in particular have developed. You can find the text of this talk on my weblog at http colon forward slash forward slash davidcavill.wordpress.com We all live with genetic defects. I am short-sighted and suffer from a number of allergies, as did my mother. I have a friend who is epileptic, as was her mother. Another is diabetic, and I have just heard that someone close to me has developed breast cancer. All these conditions have a high hereditability, that is, their genetic component is significant. If you are the direct descendant of someone who has any of these conditions, you will not necessarily get them yourself, but the likelihood of them occurring is much higher than it would otherwise have been. Scientists have identified around 3,000 genetic defects in humans, about 300 in dogs. This is not the place for long explanations, but there are some words which were badly used in the Pedigree Dogs Exposed program and in the furore surrounding it. Some have emotional overtones that add to misunderstanding and bias, so it might be helpful to go through some definitions. Firstly, a genetic condition refers to a physical or mental disorder caused by an absent or defective gene or by a chromosomal aberration. The makeup of the genetic material of the sperm and egg is such that the DNA of the resulting embryo is damaged. Most damaged embryos are detected and aborted, but many are not, so the embry su embryo survives and is born. The condition may mean the baby will not survive, and unfortunately in some cases the child is severely disabled. However, more commonly the child becomes an adult and learns to live with the condition often with the help of medication. This is not the same as a congenital condition. This is where the original embryo was fine, but suffers damage between fertilization and birth. The mother smoking, drinking or having an accident may cause congenital problems. The best known example is the tragic consequence of thalidomide being prescribed to women who were pregnant. A mutation is quite different. In genetics, a mutation is a permanent, transmissible change in genetic material as a result of a miscopying of a section of DNA. This can be caused by environmental factors, such as radiation, or by the age of the mother or father, because eggs and sperm deteriorate over the years. It is mutation which has produced us. It is the whole basis of evolution, and without it we would not exist. It is also entirely random. Most mutations have little effect but occasionally one occurs which improves the organism's chances of survival. To describe any living creature with a genetic disability as a mutant shows deplorable ignorance from someone who has even a basic knowledge of genetics. As humans have developed companion animals to be more and more useful, there has been a conscious desire to fix certain characteristics. At the simplest level, it was breeding dogs which were faster to help hunt with hunting, and later, as nomads became farmers, cows were bred to give more milk, sheep for more coat, to provide more wool, chickens to lay more eggs, and all of them, as well as pigs, goats and geese, to give more meat. This process, called selective breeding, is common throughout agriculture. However, fixing one characteristic which was desirable could also fix others which were less so. Random liaisons between animals tend to keep their DNA healthy. This is called hybrid vigour although, as we've seen in humans, it cannot do so altogether. It is for this reason that most societies forbid marriage between those directly related to each other, although many societies are comfortable with a cousin marrying a cousin. And if both are fit and healthy, this is not normally a problem. And there are plenty of examples where cousin-to-cousin -cousin marriages have been contracted down several generations without any difficulties. The reason is that what is called their inbreeding coefficient the measure of how close two people are genetically related to each other is just six and a quarter percent. And for most couples in this position, there is little likelihood of serious genetic defects arising, although of course there's always a risk. Most human relationships have an inbreeding coefficient of much less than six and a quarter percent. But because of the complexity of human DNA, many children are still born with genetic defects. This can happen between people who are not at all related Unfortunately, most are not very serious. Genetic defects are in our genes and will sometimes occur. 
This is very simplistic, I know, but I hope it makes the situation clearer. Most pedigree dogs are line bred, that is, they are mated to members of the same family, although seldom very closely. In fact, the average inbreeding coefficient on the Kennel Club registry is between 4 and 5 per cent. Close inbreeding, where fathers are mated to daughters or vice versa, or mothers are mated to sons or vice versa, is not common. Less than 1 per cent of puppies on the KC register are bred this closely. A common rule of thumb for dog breeders is line breed two generations and then outcross. Basically, this means that in each two-generation layer of a pedigree, you will find the sire and the dam of the puppies more than once, but in every third layer, you would find a dog which was not repeated anywhere. In dog breeding, responsible breeders will try to select dogs and bitches which are good examples of their breed, and the good ones will ensure their stock is not carrying serious defects. This is not true of everyone, of course, and I'm afraid that those who breed large numbers of puppies without the expertise and care the dogs deserve often have, have little regard for their health and welfare. However, what was not made clear in Pedigree Dogs Exposed was that there are two separate issues here, genetic conditions and selective breeding. Although they are connected, they are different. It is relatively easy to change the conformation and performance of an animal by selective breeding. Frisian cows are bred primarily to give milk. Their flesh is not very suitable for meat, and most meat from Frisian cows ends up in derivative products such as pies, sausages and dog food, because it looks very unappetising. At the other end of the scale, Aberdeen Angus give exceptional meat, but their cows give little milk. When countrymen wanted dogs which would go to ground and flush out vermin, they used selective breeding to produce dogs with the right conformation very quickly. In fact, Experiments at the turn of the last century show that given a group of mongrels, a breeder could produce a creditable example of any breed within five generations. You like the idea of a hairy dog with a flat face? Just collect some small mongrels and mate them. Select those puppies with the longest coats and the shortest muzzles and mate them. Continue the process and you very soon have a Pekingese. Our British, gun dog and terrier breeds were all created in just this way. It is simple and it works. However, it is possible to take a specific characteristic too far, as has happened with some breeds, and this will inevitably lead to problems of confirmation. This is not the same as deleterious damaging genetic conditions. As you change the confirmation of the dog by selectively breeding, the rest of the dog's anatomy is stretched or compressed to fit. Up to a point, this does, ma does not matter. As I explained in my previous talk, so long as the dog can eat, breathe, walk, run, mate, and whelp normally, then its conformation and head shape is unimportant. But once its conformation affects those natural behaviours, then however attractive the breeders and potential owners find the look of the breed, their conformation should be modified. It is easy, you just reverse the process. You do not have to start again. Four or five generations is all it takes. However, in getting a desired conformation, breeders will tend to use the same small group of dogs, and if they have a deleterious genetic disease, then this will become endemic within that breed. This is why dogs which should be perfectly sound from the point of view of their conformation may develop a specific genetic problem. Breeders have relied on too narrow a gene pool. These conditions are more difficult to breed out, but introducing dogs from outside the breed into the breeding program can solve it. This has been done with Kennel Club approval, and I'm sure that in the next few years it will be done much more often. But I must emphasise that although some of these genetic diseases are serious, and of course very distressing for the owner, the majority, like short-sightedness in humans, are a minor inconvenience, which can be treated or managed. So the instance of a genetic condition in a breed does not mean all the dogs are ill or damaged. Some will be, I'm afraid, but for many, their dysplasia or patelloluxation or their eye problem is nothing more than a minor inconvenience. Few dogs die of genetic disease. And it is also important to note that, as in humans, for many or even most breeds, a deleterious genetic condition usually has a very low incidence. Go to a dog show. See for yourself. Thank you.